Good evening, black people and all allies fighting for black liberation, black prosperity, and black joy. I'm Charles Blow, and welcome to Prime. Law enforcement is on high alert, and D.C. police say that they will be all hands on deck as protective fencing around the Capitol was reinstalled ahead of a Justice for J6 protest planned for Saturday. The worry is that this could be a sequel to the January 6th riot, like an insurrectionist attack the Capitol's part two. But instead of questioning the safety and necessity of protests like that, you have governors like Florida's Ron DeSantis with his new anti-protest law, more obsessed with criminalizing black joy. Chief U.S. District Judge Mark Waller, uh, Mark Walker in Tallahassee recently ruled against the governor saying he was wrong to equate, equate community celebrations of Juneteenth with that of a protest. And for that, the judge has temporarily blocked DeSantis' sweeping anti-protest measure, which was signed into law in April. But his state is not the only one to enact anti-protest laws since last summer, which are, by the way, mostly aimed at black people. According to the International Center for Not-for-Profit Law, which tracks anti-protest laws, 20 states have enacted such measures since 2017. Many of those governors have not been vocal about Saturday's protests, which, according to the Department of Homeland Security, could have up to 700 people. So where's the anti-protest outrage for that? Joining me now to discuss is co-founder of the LA chapter of Black Lives Matter, Dr. Melina Abdullah. Dr. Abdullah, why is it so profoundly problematic to criminalize peaceful protest? So where do we start? Where do we start? It's really, really important to remember that this is not just a criminalization of protest. We have a right to protest. The First Amendment protects our right to protest. But DeSantis's bill actually is targeting particular protests, particularly black protests. It's targeting protests like the organizers, the very successful and visionary organizers of organizations like the Dream Defenders, right? Like the Movement for Black Lives, like Black Lives Matter. It's targeting us and pretending as if the demonstrations that we engage in, which are in essentially for the advocacy of peace, to say, stop killing our people. That is a message of peace, right? Um, the violence actually comes at the hands of law enforcement, who often brutalizes our people. DeSantis's bill intends to silence and um, really stop the voices of dissent, right? The voices that say that we have a right to be. DeSantis's bill also protects the real perpetrators of violence. It protects people who want to mow us down with their cars. It protects it protects um, police who want to brutalize us with billy clubs and uh, pepper spray and sometimes stun guns, rubber bullets, and even real bullets. And so this is a huge problem, and it's not just a problem that stays in Florida. We see copycat bills all across this country, and we have to stand for our right to speak up on behalf of our people. What are the specific language in the bills that target these kind of social justice protests, but not, say, people who are protesting masks in schools? Right. So, again, these um, targeted bills are looking at organizations like Black Lives Matter, like Dream Defenders, even like organizations like uh, the NAACP and saying that the kinds of demonstrations that black people specifically are engaging in are problematic. What they don't do is point to the sometimes very violent protesters that are on the side that form the base for people like DeSantis, right? He has yet to really condemn the January 6th protesters. He has yet to really condemn the kind of ways in which anti-maskers are engaging in violence by doing things like coughing in the faces of those of us who want to stay safe from COVID-19. And so these are not considered protests that should be um, quelled in the eyes of DeSantis. What he wants to do is stomp out 
black protest, progressive protest, the kind of protest that really is about democratic values. You know, part of the problem is the very definition of what is becomes a violent protest, what becomes a mob, what becomes a riot. Uh, as it's set up, if anyone in the group becomes violent, then the entire protest could be therefore deemed violent, even though there are peaceful people in it. That sets up a condition where anyone could sabotage a protest by introducing violence on purpose. How dangerous is that to the movement? That's extremely dangerous. In fact, there's several research studies that show over the last year and a half, there have actually been um, provocateurs placed into crowds that do things like hurl bricks, that do things like spray graffiti. And many of them are actually um, working for someone other than the people, right? They're meant to be provocateurs. They're meant to kind of quash the message of the protest. So when we were standing up almost on a daily basis, demanding justice in the name of George Floyd, demanding justice in the name of Breonna Taylor, demanding justice of the, in the name of people like Dijon Kazee in Los Angeles, those of us who were engaging in this work um, would sometimes be met with people that we'd never seen before, largely uh, non-Black folks, who would um, then be engaging in ways that were not really organized by those of us who were organizing the protests. Any one of them could be used. And remember, some of these folks are, you know, regular people, but some of these folks may be on payrolls. And there are many studies that are kind of revealing now that some of them actually were planted in the crowds to do these things. Um, they could turn the protest, quote unquote, violent. So you don't have to be engaged in violence in order to be considered and swept up under this new law. And so what this is meant to do is have a chilling effect on demonstrations, make people second guess um, their right to actually demonstrate because our behavior then becomes bound together with everyone in a crowd, crowds that sometimes are hundreds and thousands, even tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands in the cases of some of the protests of last summer. And so this is a very dangerous, and I would say um, uh, it's a dangerous bill, but it's also unconstitutional. And so we have to be very, very careful about what these kinds of bills might mean. We also have to make demands of lawmakers who might not be as far right as DeSantis in cities like mine. I live in Los Angeles. We see even liberal lawmakers trying to protect themselves from protest um, by passing ordinances. In Los Angeles, they just passed a city ordinance meant to shut down protest or move protest away from the homes of political targets, right? We have to remember that protest is something that people sign up for when they become public officials. And so protest is something that all of us must protect with every ounce of ourselves. Otherwise, we're going to be kind of forced into the house, forced into a life of silence, and forced to, dem to kind of accept those things that are imposed on us by a system that has never been um, really willing to push forward for our liberation. We have to struggle for liberation, and one of the key ways in which we struggle is through protest. Black Lives Matter could never have gotten away with storming the Capitol, even if they were not shot dead, which I think they would have been. There would have been enormous hue and cry and investigation of how this happened and, make, and laws passed to make sure it didn't never happen again. But Republicans have consistently defended uh, the people who stormed the Capitol. Uh, they refused to vote for a bipartisan commission to look into what happened. And now that we have a new protest coming this Saturday, Republicans on Capitol Hill are distancing themselves from that protest, but not vocally condemning it. What do you make of the hypocrisy around attacking the protests of people who are protesting for social justice and kind of turning their back on the uh, insurrectionists and, and pretending that it is not as big a deal as it actually was? Right. And I think that the word that you just spoke, Charles, is exactly the word. It is the height of hypocrisy. When you talk about 
black people who are demanding that our people get to live and walk freely, who are demanding that people don't um, have knees ground into their necks until their breaths are gone, right? Who are demanding that black women have a right to sleep peacefully in their homes, who are demanding that black men like Dijon Kizzee have a right to ride their bicycles at 1 p.m. on a weekday in their own neighborhoods, right? Those are peaceful demonstrations. Those are demands for peace. But when we talk about really what is white supremacist terrorism in this country, we don't see condemnations by those who are claiming that they are trying to shut down things that um, lead to violence. They are willing to accept and even um, willing to kind of accept the benefits um, for their political wing that come from white supremacist violence and white supremacist terrorism, even as they attempt to quash the black folks and allies who are saying, we simply want to be able to live and walk in peace. Dr. Molina Abdullah, thank you so much for your time tonight. I really do appreciate it. Next up, President Biden lays out his plan to tax the rich. Well, does it go far enough? We'll answer that right after the break. You're watching Prime on BNC.